Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is an award-winning writer and artist who splits her time between the UK and Texas. She has an MA and has taught writing for many years at the college level through several writing organizations and as a private tutor. After moving to the States from England, she and her family vacationed in Galveston, Texas each summer. Her dream of owning her own little house by the sea came true Years later, Shiny Bits in Between is a homage to Bolivia Peninsula, a remote community on the Texas Gulf Coast. And her second novel, Syllables of the Briny World, picks up three years later when her beloved characters must face a deadly hurricane. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Georgina Key. Thank you, Julia. Appreciate you having me on. Georgina, our opening question on authors over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Um, well, it was sort of an accident. I I have, like many of your interviewees, I'm sure, been writing all my life, but it was always just for me. And I, I never really thought about sharing it with people. And I'd show it to a few people here and there, and they'd always, pre- you know, compliment me on it and but it just never occurred to me to to share it with a bigger audience and um I had been teaching writing for many years I my husband and I founded a literary zine for children to have their voices heard so that that uh was a way for me to sort of um uh empower them I suppose and then I worked for a writers in the schools where I again worked with children and then I ended up homeschooling my younger son for most of his school years. Um, and so all of that kind of took up a lot of time, but I was always immersed in that world and I was always writing. And I saw a advertisement for Imprint is an organization in Houston, a wonderful organization. And they had a discounted classes for teachers. So I thought, well, I'm a homeschool teacher. Maybe I could do that. And they let me take it. And that was kind of my first experience at workshopping. And I became addicted and (laughs) I loved it. And I took lots of workshops. And, you know, even though I had been writing all sorts of bits and pieces, and I've always written poetry, um, I realized in that workshop, that first workshop, that they kind of fit together. You know, we all have our favorite themes and we, we gravitate towards those. And I realized that all these seemingly disparate pieces of writing actually told a story. And so I started piecing them together. And at a certain point, I thought, you know what, I think I might have a book here. So I started looking at from that perspective. And then I finished it. And I thought, well, I wonder if I should share this with people. I took a manuscript class with um, Grackle and Grackle, another wonderful writing organization that I teach at and and take classes at Um, and they had a manuscripts class so you get got a critique from the whole class of your entire manuscript and that was just priceless and really helped me polish my book for querying so I uh, so I that's kind of how I went from just keeping things to myself journaling writing poetry to actually seriously considering a book 
Do you feel more pressure as a writing teacher when you're writing a book? Do people expect more from you than from us just regular humans? <laughs> well, most of the teachers that they hire are published authors, so they kind of expect that. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I, I love it. I love teaching. I've done it, you know, most of my life, and it really fuels me to pull out these unique voices of students, of, of, of these regular people, as you said. <laughs> and, you know, there are so many talented, creative writers out there that don't get heard, and that's what I try to do. Well, once you finished your manuscript, how did you proceed? You mentioned querying. Did you search for an agent? Did you decide yeah. to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? I queried for a while, um, probably, I don't know how long, I can't remember, six months maybe or something, but I really lucked out, which I think is often what happens. Um, I took a writing class at this organization called Write Space in Houston. And I was sort of sharing odd pieces of my manuscript here and there. And a publisher of an indie press happened to be in the class taking it as well. And she loved my writing. And she we would talk about it and she would ask to see some pages and she really seemed to, it resonated with her. And so uh, I thought, well, why not? I'll just see if I can, I'll, I'll ask her if she would read my manuscript. So I submitted it through her her pub, her um, press, and she accepted it. So take workshops, people. <laughs> you never know what could come out of it. Yes, yeah, spread your manuscripts around, and maybe fate will yeah. bring you together with the publisher. Networking is so important. I mean, I when I finished my first manus my first book, my manuscript, I immersed myself in the writing community. I really tried to spread my feelers and get to know people and go to conferences and um workshops and and it I think it really made a difference and it still does I mean I still do that what do you think is the most challenging part of your artistic process it's really making time for myself to write um it helps that my son who I homeschooled is now in college and so I have more time to myself now so I'm able to do that but I'm not a, a, a super disciplined person <laughs> so it's, I'm not one of those people that gets up at eight and starts writing the whole day every day you know I it, I kind of have to um get inspired which is easy I mean I I listen to music I read a lot of poetry I, I love art so I if I feel like I need a little push I'll do that and it'll get me going did writing your first book change your process of writing? I think writing my first book was a very different process from writing my second book. So when I wrote my first book, like I said, it was kind of an accident. It just sort of organically evolved into a book. Um, so I didn't really, it. the initial little seed I had ended up barely being part of the book. It it became something completely different from what I had first planned, if, if you can even call it planned. Uh and so, but I knew that I was going to write a sequel of sorts. I knew it was going to be a two-part story right from the beginning. So with the second book, I really planned more and knew where I was going. You know, the plotter, panster uh, labels. I'm definitely a panster, but I'm trying to be more of a plotter just because uh, I, I think uh, it's something I need to try harder on and and you know make more of an effort because the, the writing itself comes pretty easily but the 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 plot driven stuff is a little bit of a challenge for me I'm getting better at it though I'm surprised you're a pantser as a writing teacher I would think you would be very analytical and have lots of outlines and lots of uh, uh, vehicles to get you into the story I do, but not outlining. <laughs> I have a lot of vehicles to get me into the story. Um, place is always a really big part setting in my books. It really is a character. And immersing myself in a place really helps me write. Um, so that's a big part of it. And then just reading and being inspired by other authors. 
but I think I'm very much an intuitive writer more than an analytical. I'm an, I'm a sort of an analytical reader. Uh, I do think a lot about subtext and things like that. Um, and it's funny being a writer now and being really immersed in that. It makes you a different sort of reader as well, because I'm reading as a writer rather than just a reader. And I have to try to turn that switch off so that I can, you know, try to just appreciate a book for what it is and not, how did she do that? How did... <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> I know. I think being an author kind of ruin, ruins reading for us because we're always trying to analyze or edit or, or understand their plot. And, and it um, turns us more into an editor than a reader. No, I try really hard to switch it off. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. <laughs> what about your titles? What do your titles mean? Uh, shiny bits in between. So it's a it's a it it's a story that has some darkness in it, some tragic elements in it, and these two women who have suffered the same loss are sort of battling their way through their grief to try to get out of the other side. And they end up sort of helping each other to heal through that because they understand each other and what they're going through. But it's that idea of looking for those shiny bits in between the darkness, always searching for the those little glimpses that keep you going and keep that hope going and help you to understand that there is hopefully a light at the end of the tunnel and it can just be a small thing. It can be, you know, a dog licking your hand or it can be um, a full moon or, you know, it can be little things, but just to, to stop and be still and appreciate those shiny bits in between. And then the syllables of the briny world. Um, the second book is a, it's a, it's a hurricane ghost story basically. And um, the hurric hurricane Ike, which you must probably remember in 2008, uh, it centers around that. So you're following the same characters from Shiny Bits, but like you said, three years on. And um, the sea itself becomes a character because the sea, the, the, the surge of water is what decimated Bolivar Peninsula during Hurricane Ike. And so the sea becomes kind of this living entity and so the syllables of the briny world, the briny world being the world of the sea and the idea of the sea speaking as a character was kind of where I got that title from. Do real people inspire any of your characters? Oh, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, the two mothers in this first story in Shiny Bits are really inspired by my grandmother and my aunt my grandma, my aunt drowned when she was 22, which she had two boys, young babies. And I never met her because I was born right after she died. But I was very close to my grandmother. And so I witnessed her grief her whole life, but ever, the whole time I knew her. And just this, this, you know, you have that family law that's passed down and it becomes almost like a fairy tale. And there was this fairy tale of my aunt who drowned in Nepal and they never found her body. And it just, you know, you know my, we would, my mom and I would imagine her being still alive, living in, in paradise with flowers in her hair. And, you know, and it just, I guess it just, it, it, it um, a pre, my, my romantic side was, was inspired by that. Um, and then, um, Later in 2005, my own son had a um, brain tumor and he almost, we, we almost lost him. And I just remember during that time, just praying that I could speak to my grandmother that because she's the only one that would really understand, you know, and that connection that I had had all those years ago felt so palpable during that time. And I think my way of dealing with my own grief and understanding her grief was was manifested in these two women and the way they cope with it in different ways you know dory the main one of the main characters is a middle-aged divorced woman who coped with it by shutting herself off from the world and just pushing away everyone who cared about her and she's she's just kind of a a, a closed person which my grandmother was like um and then 
Clementine, the the young artist that she befriends, um, manifests her grief by searching for her lost boy in the waves because he drowned and just uh, feeling like she can hear him calling to her. So I think it was a, actually a way for me to process some of my own experiences. I write very personal, even though it's fiction, you know, there is there are always a lot of personal elements in my work. A lot of us use threads of memoir throughout our fiction and and they say that that writing is therapy, you know, when we get our words down on paper, it really yeah. does help us to to understand our lives a little better. Oh, and there's one other character I have to mention on a lighter note. Um, there's a, a man in um on Bolivar Peninsula, he's a, a wood artist, a carver, and he he he's such a character. His name is the Tiki Man, and he makes tikis, and he's he looks like a pirate, and he's just a really big character. And so I included him in the book as Tiki Man, but also he he inspires another character, Pete, who fancies himself a pirate because he's a descendant of Jean Lafitte, who was an actual pirate on Bolivar Peninsula and had a lot of fun with, with Pete. He's become, he was a secondary character in the first book and he's a main character in the second one. The second one is five character, five different voices from the, if you've read the first one, you'll recognize them, but it'll be different voices that are, that are highlighted than than the other one um you don't have to have read the first one though but had a lot of fun with pete <laughs> well why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage that you've brought to share today and then read so we can hear your tone and voice in the book okay it's interesting because i had trouble deciding what passage to read because i have five different voices they're very distinct very different and so just reading one of them it's not all going to be like this but i really enjoy um, lyrical prose, as I said, I wrote poetry my whole life and and integrating that into my work. And um, the certain characters lend themselves really well to that. Uh, other ones are very more grounded and, you know, like Pete's a pirate. So, of course, he's just sassy and, you know, drinks too much <laughs> and pillages. <laughs> but the, the passage I decided to read is just the opening passage in the book, uh, Briny syllables of the briny world um and one of the one of the characters in the story is a group of characters called the lost boys um and primarily finn who is clementine's son who drowned so it has magical realism elements to it throughout the book as i said the sea is kind of a character in the book as well so i just thought i'd read the opening passage so that you could get a feel for that the lost boys Finn stood in the foyer of the Seaview Hotel, which was empty except for the furnishings that faded in and out, apparitions hovering between worlds. Its inhabitants were unsettled, restless. Something was amiss. Beyond was sunshine warming a slim stretch of land surrounded by the Texas Gulf, a place where people lived their ordinary lives. But within the hotel's confinement, was a powerful charge that hummed within the walls and floors so that it couldn't be ignored. And there were always the distant whispers, which Finn knew were not the wind. He needed his tower now. The grand staircase rose before him. Once the pride of the peninsula, the Seaview Hotel had glowed white against the blue-green water, a beacon of hope and healing. The newly constructed railroad brought visitors who flocked to take the mineral cures the Gulf offered. Those lies had left their mark on the place, as had time and tide. Sometimes Finn would see people gliding through the salon, wearing long dresses and hats, dinner jackets and spats. But then the light would change and they'd be gone. Other times, thick vines reached through broken windows and encircled brass curtain rods, only to disappear moments later. Finn reached for the curved oak banister, his hand brushing its smooth surface, surface as he climbed the stairs. His tower, where he went to be alone and to draw, was at the very top of the hotel. Finn preferred that forgotten space where ghosts of the past tended not to tread. 
He pushed the door open and entered the brightness. Its very peak rose just above the membrane that contained the hotel and up to the world beyond. Finn sat at a rickety wooden table and picked up his pencil, resting its point on a thick page. The tower overlooked the flint-flaked sea, and he bid his hand draw what his eyes saw, sea skein greens and greys twisted and curled beneath the calico sky. He added crosshatches of graphite that darkened the pale wisps of cloud, the motion of his hand taking a life of its own. The lead point pressed hard so the paper trenched and tore and ripped like the waves that gouged the sand below. Deep in the dark damp, layers of sediment were buried, carcasses of sea creatures, brittle shell, and fossilized bone that once protected or enabled legs to crawl or tails to flick. Where did their breath go, their thoughts after they died, Finn wondered. He watched his hands scrape and shade the page. It looked like an ordinary boy's hand. When he was alive, he imagined spirits as vaporous shadows, but his hand looked solid. Perhaps others, those still in the world of the living, would see him the way he saw those who wandered through the Seaview Hotel, drifting in and out of his vision. Finn's eyes darted from the landscape outside the tower to the page in front of him, back and forth, back and forth, until they focused on the hem of the horizon, which began to shimmer and unstitch. It cracked into a thousand pieces, shards like glass piercing the ocean below, each one a stabbing pain where his heart once beat. He closed his eyes to the vision, tried to block out the truth of what was to come. The sea turned viscous, reaching her curled fingers toward the tower. And when they wrapped around him, he again felt the intensity of Sea Mother's love. Shh. Shh. A voice the waves themselves. Do you miss your Sea Mother? Circling him, pulling at his vanishing heart. Come back to me, so I may love you again. Finn slumped to the floor, gave in to the lull of her words, the immensity of her desire for him. All around was chaos, the wind above roiling her depths so that Finn twisted in the undertow, losing all sense of bearing. She drew him deeper, each cross current pulling him further down where it was quiet. He rocked in her liquid embrace. You are safe here with me. His tower teetered and then fell. Finn's sight slowly cleared. Sea Mother had shown him a vision a storm of such magnitude it would devour everything in its path. Though Finn had known Sea Mother to be a capricious territorial entity, he trusted the vision she offered him. Was she punishing him for abandoning her? Maybe, but this felt far bigger, a revenge against the vanity of man. Maybe if he could capture the ocean on the page in front of him, he could show Sea Mother she was loved, quell her anger. Painting is how I love the world. Finn had heard that once. He picked up the pencil. He would try again. But time was running out. Georgina, that's beautiful. Thank you. Your imagery is just lovely. Thank you. So that, yeah, the Lost Boy passages are sort of more like that. And then, like I said, there's other voices that are very different. It's just dreamy. <laughs> good that was what I was going for <laughs> well I know that this book doesn't launch until April of 2024 yeah yeah but tell us about you know we writers don't like to promote ourselves and we have challenges with publicity and marketing tell us about trying to find ideas that worked for you for the first book and and post publication of the first book and then what you've been doing to promote the second well I haven't really promoted the second one yet since it is kind of far off uh like I said I'm working on the developmental edits right now um but I figured this would be a nice opportunity and so you're the first one to <laughs> to share this um but the first book I published in 2020 so it was with the same press uh, and it was during COVID. So it, I had a big launch planned and right before, it was like a month before it was due to happen, COVID hit. So that was obviously, you know, a lot of us went through that, I think. But um, so the launch 
became an online launch, which in a way was kind of cool because I had friends from all over the place in my friends and family in the UK. I have friends all over, you know, from New Zealand and um, the Philippines where my husband's from. And so it was kind of a, a, a big realm that watched this, this launch that wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So to look on, to find the shiny bits, that was, that was definitely a shiny bit. Um, and I just tried to make it as interesting and big as possible and have guest speakers and music and an interview and and read from passages from the book. And it was ended up being really fun. And then after that, you know, I did a few Zoom interviews like this. Um, and fortunately, I think people understood the difficulties of launching, publishing a book in COVID. So the the promotion for Shiny Bits lasted a long time. <laughs> So once COVID was over, I had a lot of book club visit, author visits. I had a, um, some book signings at bookstores. I had a couple of really cool events. A friend of mine is a chef in Houston, and she put on a special dinner that she cooked with bought with coastal theme food and drinks. And people bought tickets and got a copy of my book. And I did a reading. And so, and then of course, just social media, doing a lot of posting. I had a lot of fun with. Um, you know, if if anyone looks back at my 2020 social media posts, they'll see a lot of fun little, you know, cre I tried to be really creative because I knew people were sitting at home by themselves, isolated. So I tried to sort of really show footage of my, the real house, the real little yellow house, which was our house that we lost in Ike. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Tiki Man was, was featured and I had um, videos of driving down to Bolivar on the coast and and sort of going through all the areas that I talked about in the book. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to do some similar things for this one too. Hopefully with a bit more scope and a bit more real in-person <laughs> stuff. Well, I know that pre-launch starts many, many moons before the launch yeah. and and publicists try to get us to write lots of articles and and all of that. So I'm sure when your edit editing is finished, you'll be right into the the pre-launch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's kind of fun. I mean, I actually like, you know, you always get a bit nervous, but I actually enjoy it talking to, to people about writing and um, books and what's, you know, what makes people tick and how they create these things they create. And I just get really excited about being immersed in that world. I think that Zoom is the one good thing that came out of the pandemic because I'd never even heard of it. And then during the um, pandemic, as you said, we could reach out and go into people's living rooms all around the world and and have book clubs and so that's been very very nice for me yeah yeah I know it's been great and we're still doing it which is good I mean I I'm in Scotland I wouldn't have been able to do it if we were in person it does make the world a lot smaller it does yeah do you Google yourself or read reviews? And if so, how do you deal with the bad or the good ones? Of course. <laughs> um, you know, when the first the book first came out, yes, because I was really anxious to see what people thought. And um, of course, when they say good things, it's it validates you and you feel like, oh, I've reached people. You know, I think that's the biggest thrill is to find your readers and have them have your book resonate with them to the point where they'll send you like last week or the week. No, it was longer than that. Um, last month I got a Facebook message from a reader who had said she loved my book. And then she said, um, can you tell me where the real little yellow house is on the peninsula? Cause we're going for a girl's weekend next weekend and I'd love to drive by it. And I said, well, we, you know, it, we lost it in Ike. But you can see the one we rebuilt and look at that. So she, you know, stuff like that is just magical. So, and then the not, I mean, then the not such good stuff. I mean, I was fortunate I didn't have too many negative ones, but I, or really any particularly negative ones. But if if there is a criticism, I I try to listen to it and hear it and see if it's valid for for my writing. It, you know, you can't please every reader. 
And I understand that. And and if you don't please one reader, you can't take it personally. Um, I think there's there's always a, it's always going to be a mixed bag. So trying to kind of perhaps reconsider your story from a different point of view, um, but being true to your voice, you've got to be true to your voice, be authentic. Well, you certainly have a beautiful voice and you're on the right path if you're writing series because they tell us until we write several books in a series, we don't start to really earn out as an author. So you're certainly on the right path. Well, I have a a, a, a vague notion of maybe doing a prequel for this series, but right now I'm halfway through in my third book, which is set in guess where <laughs> the UK <laughs> so I'm well into that one which is completely separate from the first two um but again it's very personal to me and uh I'm enjoying it it's a new very different setting but you know it's that be having one foot in Texas which has been my home for so long and then another foot in where I was born and raised I know both play, places pretty intimately and, and, it, and that's an unusual thing. And so I want to try to share that with readers through my writing. What does writing success look like to you personally? I would love to reach a wider audience because I'm with a small press. It's a little bit limited. Distribution is, you know, limited. And I, I would love more readers. <laughs> it's just finding a way to get to them. Um, I I do have a strong following in Bolivar. Um, they carry my books in stores in Bolivar, but, you know, I, I'd like to expand that. Um, and then just, you know, I, I, I'd I love some recognition award-wise. I did get two awards for my first book, um, and that was great because I really, um, I want to reach readers. I want to, my stories to be, accessible but I do sort of have a, a sort of poetic voice that that I hope um is recognized maybe what by uh some kind of yeah you know, some kind of recognition would be awesome well I'm sure that all you need to do is find the the right place to to put your book for recognition because it would definitely win awards in the literary um, the literary category thank you i appreciate that that's really nice thank you i will try <laughs> well georgina as always our last interview question is our writers over 50 are a unique group do you have any advice for writers 50 and above well you probably get this all the time but really don't let it's never too late. You 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 can start any time. Uh, I I published my first book when I was fifty five. Um, my second one I'll be sixty. So, you know, I hadn't published anything before that. Um, and then just just remember to have fun and don't be afraid. Just just go for it. That's wise advice today, and I I too believe that that we can write the rest of our lives. I'm interviewing people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are turning out beautiful work. And so I think it's like swimming. We can do it the rest of our lives. And and I just appreciate your being with us all the way from, from uh, the UK today. And we appreciate that we can now count you among our authors over 50. Thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.